knowledge, used 172 times in 169 verses of the Bible. The art of defeating ignorance and gaining knowledge, both divine and natural. Of Jesus Christ is tremendously offensive to the spiritual realm. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembrick. And I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television and Radio. Great to have our viewers today and those who are listening on radio. As we go through the Bible in one year, we are focused on the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse, or chapter 4 through 6. And we are going to be talking today about the truth about the offending name. As a matter of fact, it is understood that demonic forces even shudder at the sound of that name. What are we talking about? Coming up in a moment. Corey is here to tell us about Bible history. Corey? Today we are evaluating alternate theories to the resurrection. Uh-oh, alternate theories to the, the swoon theory and all the rest of it, very interesting. Did Jesus really raise from the dead? All right, we'll talk about it. All right, do you know? Do you know? What name did the prophets give to Joses? He was a Levite who sold land, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. If we can't get the answer later, I'll give a hint. Oh, ladies later. and gentlemen, we've reached a new level on Do You Know? We now have hints. Every now and again, I do. You're becoming merciful mm. because blessed are the merciful for <laughs> they shall obtain mercy. All of this and more is coming your way. Thank you for joining us on Quick Study. Let's study on. of Acts, the Apostle Peter gets himself into trouble with the Sanhedrin. But my question is, what is the Sanhedrin and, and how did it operate? Because we see references to it, not just here in Acts, but also in the Gospels. The Sanhedrin was a group of religious leaders who appear many times in the New Testament, often clashing with Jesus and even each other. The Sanhedrin made up the highest Jewish religious authority in the first century AD. Their claimed origin was with the 70 elders appointed by Moses in the Torah. But there doesn't seem to be much evidence backing this up. There are no references to the Sanhedrin in the Old Testament or in other ancient records. The Sanhedrin does appear on the scene sometime between the Old Testament and the New. The Sanhedrin likely formed after the Maccabean Revolt that brought political and religious freedom back to Israel for a time. Despite their late appearance, the influence of the Sanhedrin on life in first century Jerusalem was quite large. The Sanhedrin was made up of two main groups, the Sadducees and Pharisees. It is these two groups with their differing beliefs about the law that caused much of the tension recorded in the Gospels. The Sadducee party was made up of chief priests of the Jerusalem temple, who claimed to be descendants of Zadok, the high priest of King Solomon's time. Not all priests were Sadducees, but all Sadducees were priests, and aristocratic priests at that. The Sadducees strictly believed that only the law, the five books of Moses, should be held as God-given. They rejected the oral law of the Pharisees and any ideas of a spiritual world beyond God existing. The Pharisees, who made up the main body of the Sanhedrin, focused mainly on synagogues and public life. Their very title means separated ones, and they were viewed as teachers of the people. 
They held on to the Mosaic Law and also the Oral Law, a law code about the Mosaic Law. The main clash between the Pharisees and Jesus was over Jesus' criticism of this Oral Law. The Sanhedrin, though often divided, held much influence in Jerusalem, and when united on an issue, could force real action by Rome. It's time to explore the wise guys of the Bible in our reading assignment today is Acts chapters 4 through chapter 6. Now in the modern Western world, Peter and John would have a case for discrimination invoking the so-called hate crime laws. It all happened because they had the absolute audacity to help and heal a man who was lame in the name of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine? They were arrested by the religious elite and formally charged. An explanation was demanded from the temple high priest. Peter then offered the explanation in full form. But this name that he uses is so powerful that they are charged never to use it again. Why is the name Jesus Christ so offensive? Let us explore Acts chapter 4. Four, one through twelve. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Rod Hembry here. You're watching Quick Study Television, listening to Quick Study Radio. Great to have you along with us. We are studying the book of Acts, and today, Acts chapter 4 will be our focus. Now, remember, we have come through the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have seen the first part of Acts in which the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and the church was born. And what a time it was in Jerusalem. Now then, we come to the result of that. You see, the religious elite of the day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin, they felt they had finally gotten rid of Jesus. That yes, they, they knew that people said they saw him resurrected and he even spoke to them and taught them in his resurrected form, but they could make some kind of lie up or something and cover that up. It'll slowly fade away. That was the idea. You know, it'll slowly fade away. In fact, in one argument in front of the Sanhedrin, which we'll get to as we read through the scripture here, one wise man, Gamaliel, he says, you know, gentlemen, if this thing about Jesus is real, there's nothing you can do about it. It's going to stay. But if this thing about Jesus is just another one of these fads, ah, it'll fade away. Well, guess what? 2,000 years later, it hasn't faded away. It's real. 
and it's exciting. And today we read about the name, the powerful offending name of Jesus Christ to the religious elite of the land. So let's take a look at Acts chapter four, verse one. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priest, the captains of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. These are the disciples, okay? So the religious elite now come upon the disciples speaking about Jesus. Being greatly disturbed that the, the, these disciples taught the people and preached Jesus resurrected from the dead. How dare they? Don't they understand they have to be approved by the International Federation of Religious Elite? Well, I added that part. That's really not scripture. Let's get back to the scripture now. Verse three, and they laid hands on them. In other words, they grabbed them, manhandled them, and put them in custody until the next day. For it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of them men came to about 5,000. What? Did you hear that? <laughs> the disciples, okay, we had several thousand on the day of Pentecost, but the disciples the next day and the next week began to teach Jesus Christ, and there's some like 5,000 men, you know, came to know Christ. Uh, and what an amazing time this was of church growth. But it wasn't easy, because what was happening is the territorial spirits that had manipulated mankind with the powers of religion and had manipulated them with the spells of spiritual trinkets, that was being challenged with the truth of Jesus Christ. And so the name of Jesus Christ is deeply offensive to humans and their religions because it is powerful. Why do you think that Jesus Christ is a swear word? Why not Superman or Spider-Man? Uh, why not, you know, Iron Man or Tony Stark? Why does it have to be Jesus Christ? Because there is a particular edge to that name that we must use it, use it, you know, to, to try to get rid of that guy. That's a spirit. Acts chapter 4, verse 5 says, And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, their elders, and their scribes, as well as Ananias, who was the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, as many as were of the family of the high priest, well, they were gathered at Jerusalem. Verse 7, Acts 4. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked them, By what power or by what name have you done this? You see, what they had done is they've not only taught about Jesus, but they healed a man, okay? Well, then Peter, look at this line, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by which means he has been made well, let it be known to you and all, and to the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Messiah, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here healed and whole. Now what had happened is this. They were teaching Jesus and also there was a man who was actually uh, lame and he was asking at the gate beautiful, you know, he's asking for money because he can't work and well, Peter looks down at him and he says, well, silver and gold we do not have. But I'll tell you what we do have. We have the name and the power of Jesus Christ. So in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And he didn't just go walking. He went walking and leaping. And he didn't just go walking and leaping. He went walking, leaping, and praising God. Who was he praising? He was praising Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Messiah. Well, this was offensive. So Jesus Christ is so powerful that 56 nations in the world have actually outlawed preaching about him as Lord. And by the way, they're all members of the UN. Have you ever wondered about that? It's interesting, isn't it? You can check me out on that by going to voicethemartyrs.com, opendoors.com. Check it out. You might find it interesting. The Bible says right in the center, right in the center of the Bible, it says uh, it is better to trust in God than to put your faith in the politics of men in this world. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put your hope in the princes of this world. I'm just saying. Acts chapter 4, verse 11 says, This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now leave that scripture there. 
by, there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. So here's the point. Jesus Christ is so powerful because no one accomplished the redemption of sin upon the cross except him. He is exclusive. I want to tell you something. There's no one like Jesus. <laughs> you might say, well, Jesus is religion. No, he's not. Well, Jesus is a culture. No. You might say, well, you know, Jesus is, you know, a great man who lived long ago. And, well, you're much more than that. You see, my alcoholic friends who I stand with will tell me that they identified the higher power in the 12-step program. They don't need to call it the nebulous temperature of the universe. The higher power is Yeshua HaMashiach. The higher power is Jesus Christ. And they will tell you that after years of damaging, destructing, ripping families apart alcoholism, they were healed by the name of Jesus. I can tell you story after story after story. And by the way, Gamaliel was right. If this whole Jesus thing was just another fad, it would have died a long time ago. But now the church is million strong. Now there's something about that name. The teaching material on today's program is in print form in our Bible guide. Write for yours today. The address is coming up later. There are those who would claim that Jesus was not dead when he was buried in the tomb, thus explaining away the so-called miraculous resurrection. Right now, you and I are going to evaluate some of these views. Beginning in the 1700s, people have been intentionally and vigorously attacking the resurrection of Jesus Christ, recorded in the New Testament, the records of the early church fathers, and referenced by Roman historians. There have been handfuls of so-called swoon theories, called swoon theories because they all involve Jesus not actually dying, but passing out, being drugged, or somehow self-hypnotizing. Interestingly, when they are read, they give off an air of a studied, sure confidence. But when critically analyzed, they fall apart. And it's their very confidence that reveals a strange truth, a rather desperate need for Jesus to be a fraud. Almost everyone uses elements from the New Testament, but none is willing to take the whole thing. They look at Pilate hesitating to crucify Jesus and claim that's proof he took a bribe to save him. They see soldiers giving Christ a drink on a sponge and claim it was a mandrake potion magically concocted to act like a modern day anesthetic. Despite being logically and historically unfounded, these claims also fail to analyze history in a respectable way. When attempting to reconstruct an event, one must take into account all of the written and physical resources. To cut them up into little pieces means to take words and events out of context. Despite their historic ignorance, swoon conspiracy theories also ignore the fairly obvious medical barrier. All documents agree that Christ was crucified, but first, that he was beaten at least twice, refused sleep and water, scourged with whips, forced to carry a load, and nailed through his hands and feet, his body weight suspended. The state of physical shock and trauma of Christ inevitably led to his early demise. The real problem, though, is that of all religious leaders and philosophers, Jesus won't die. His death was the beginning of his eternal life. And despite the shame of Roman crucifixion and surrounded by thousands of witnesses, people believed what they saw. Teaching through the Bible to gather divine wisdom from God's Word has been our theme all year on Quick Study. And now for November and December, we offer the entire set of 12 Bible guides to complete this powerful project. If you've just started reading the Bible with us, now you can get the complete set of 12 Bible guides that has driven our studies on the television program the entire year. For a special offering of $20 or more, we will send you the entire set. Please keep in mind these will not be printed again. This is a limited set of 12 Bible guides taking you through the Bible to discover the wisdom from God's Word in one year. Also remember, Quick Study needs your help. 
We are supported by viewers just like you. To support us, send $20 or more for the entire Bible Guide set to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. You can call us at 519-940-8338 or 724-733-8336. Still to come on Quick Study Television and radio that you're watching and listening to, there is no wisdom or understanding that goes against God. What is that about? We'll explain it in a minute in the Wise Up segment. But right now, I'm here, Rod Hembry, along with Janice Hembry. Do you know as we explore the book of Acts? Do you know? Here it is. Do you know what name did the apostles give to Joses? He was the Levite who sold land, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Corey, do you know? It's a very scary detail. Uh, yeah, do you know, Corey? This is troubling me because I know that I know. I, I, I'm remembering that it starts with a B. We have, we have an option, Corey. Mm -hmm. We What's, have an option. Okay. Remember, we can ask for a hint. Okay, hint, yes. I would like. Corey's there, formally requesting a hint. There is a hint, but I do have to say, Corey, that I heard you say this name. Oh, no. In between takes. So you <laughs> did have names. it correct, but I didn't... Um, I didn't respond to you when you said the right name. So here's the hint. Uh, his name translates into son of encouragement. Yes. Okay. Barnabas. Barnabas <laughs> is the answer, I believe. You got it. You absolutely got it. His name was Barnabas. And that's Acts 4, verse 36. And Joses, who was also named Barnabas, Artemis by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And in the coming chapters, we're going to hear more about Barnabas, Fascinating son stuff. of encouragement. Very mm -hmm. good. And you know, uh, here we have a question that goes perfectly with this as well. Comes in from a viewer from Twitter and is Jim. Mm -hmm. And Jim says to me, Rod, do we still have to give tithes and offerings since we are now no longer living? under the Mosaic law. Well, a lot of people ask this question mm -hmm. because the Mosaic law requires offerings and tithes to reconcile themselves to God. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to answer this for you, Jim, in, a, in just in a three-step process. The first step is let's remember that the Mosaic law required offerings or atonement offerings to forgive sin. And so offerings were very much a part, the trespass offering, the sin offering, the burnt offering, the five different kinds of offering, were very much a part of restitution. You could not be forgiven of your sin unless you actually made an offering. On this side of the cross, Jesus, according to the book of Hebrews, was the final offering. So we don't, number two, we don't give offerings to gain salvation. Salvation is free by faith through the grace of Jesus Christ. So you don't give an offering to gain salvation, and you don't give an offering in order to spring a soul from hell, or, or that was the whole inquisition, or the whole uh, reformation problem. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, and also 2 Corinthians 9, Paul says that giving to the church tithes and offering is a good thing and a demonstration of your love for God. So the conditions have changed. Now you give out of joy, because God loves a joyful giver, that you have already received salvation. And so that's very, very important. Having said that, also God has chosen to finance his church, number three, and the work of his kingdom by the free will offerings of his people. Because it's always a witness. The fact that Quick Study Television is here mm -hmm. after 24 years, supported exclusively on free will offerings. Mm -hmm. We're not supported by selling stuff. We're not supported by some big grant or government support. We're supported by viewers just like you and listeners on radio just like you. And by the way, if you want to join us in the Quick Study support team, we'd love to have you with us. We can sure use your help. And remember, if you're not on the mailing list, then you can get on the mailing list for the new pocket guide. A gift in any amount. Join the Quick Study support team. It'll help us tremendously. We live on the cash flow of our viewers who choose to give. So our address in Canada and the rest of the world, and I was so blessed 
by somebody who sent 20 euros the other day mm. uh, from uh, Britain. Thank you so much. P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. 20 pounds, I should say. 20 euros came mm. from Germany. Uh, now let's go then to the U.S. address, P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. And the number there is 724-733-336. Thank you for supporting us. We need your help. And uh, may God bless you as you do so. There is a deep double standard in the modern secular media systems in the West. Persecution of human souls is rampant in this world. There are countless hours of news about genocide in various countries or peaked up reports against Israel. Yet there is virtually no news about more than 100,000 Christians who are being tortured simply for not renouncing their faith in Jesus Christ. God's wisdom is at work in us when we realize that the disinformation and neglect of modern news about the obvious violation of human rights are motivated by something deeper than meets the eye. But we must overcome through love. With that we pray, Lord, teach me to bless those who curse me and love those who persecute me. In our Wise Up segment today, we continue to study the book of Proverbs. Now, our reading assignment is Proverbs 21, 29 to 30, a couple of verses here. Let's pull out one of those verses for the show here today. It says, there is no wisdom or understanding or counsel against the Lord. That's interesting. Now, notice there that the word Lord is spelled in capitals. You know what that means? In the original Hebrew poetry, it is provider, protector. What does that mean? It means you can have all the legal counsel you want. You can have all the reasoning and all the philosophy and all the arguments against God you want. But when you realize that God is the ultimate provider and protector of your life and your soul, that every breath you draw is designed by Him, that every cell in your body was written by His engineering, then you realize it doesn't really matter all this counsel against the Lord because He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the author of your life. And you can know him today by coming to him through the power of Jesus Christ, the author of life. Pray and say, Lord, I need you today. Jesus, I need you today. I don't know all about you, but I know that I need you. Come into my heart today. Thank you for joining us today on the Quick Study Television program. Remember our address in the United States is P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania. 15668-0150. Canada, PO Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2.